Welcome to episode 27, and in this week's interview, you'll discover the following three golden business insights. Number one, the dark side of entrepreneurship and the serious effects it can have on both your physical and mental health. Number two, how far should you push your children to becoming entrepreneurs, or is it best to risk it and let them find their own way? And number three, why not thinking big enough at the outset can eventually lead you to niching yourself out of business. So stay tuned for all of that and so much more on this week's episode of The Truth About Business. I'm Benjamin Brain, and by day I'm a director of a multi-award winning family run business. And by night, I interview successful business owners to share their journeys, experiences and truths to serve as inspiration, motivation and first-hand education for like-minded entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to fast-track our own business success. This is the truth about business, told by those who have been there, done that and have the scars to prove it. From the good times to the bad the marketing strategies and sales tactics to the productivity hacks and success habits. I'm here to give you the de-sugar-coated version of what it's really like and what really works. If you're thinking of starting a business or are already in business, I created this for you. So let's get started. In this week's episode, I talk business with Sean Price. Sean's entrepreneurial career started early and by the time he was in his late teens, he'd already sold his university project rather than handing it in to be assessed for his final grade. At 18, he started his first company from the back of his bedroom and over the next 10 years, grew the business to become a globally known force in the agency industry until he turned 28 when he welcomed his newborn son and decided to take some time out to semi-retire. After spending time mentoring tomorrow's generation of entrepreneurs and failing to ignite a passion for golf, it wasn't long before Sean was back at it and after taking up key senior positions in several IT businesses, his eyes were opened up to a sector of the industry in which he knew that he could build something special. This eventually led to the creation of Velas, which Sean launched with a hand-picked team of successful industry experts back in January 2019. Since then, the business has experienced rapid growth, already becoming an internationally renowned player in the managed services field and being recognised by the top advisory firms in the world, with the team being officially recognised by Gartner in September of 2019. So Sean now spends a large amount of time travelling around the globe, spending time with his team and meeting with multi-million dollar business owners and CEOs in the States, to secure new sales contracts and pick the brains of some extraordinary high-performance people. To find out more about Sean and the services Velez provides, visit www.velezmanagedservices.com or you can find Sean on LinkedIn under Sean Price. Sean spelled S-E-A-N. This was another brilliant interview with another inspirational entrepreneur who is already extremely accomplished and is destined for even bigger things. And Sean hasn't had it easy. He openly talks in this interview about the physical and mental health problems that can often come with being an obsessively driven entrepreneur. You know, success leaves footprints. So let's take a walk with the jet-setting, go-getting, international businessman and CEO of Velez Managed Services, Sean Price. But before we do, I just want to give a quick shout out to Rachel, who left me an amazing five star review on iTunes. Rachel was a guest on the show last week and she said, I've listened to all of Ben's podcasts, hearing from entrepreneurs I knew and those I didn't. And each one has been inspirational with some real takeaway actions. It's inspiring to really hear from those who are running their own businesses, their advice and their honest accounts of how challenging it can be. I'm now so proud to be one of Ben's guests. Thank you, Rachel. And even though I was nervous at first, he soon put me at ease. All the episodes are strongly recommended. It really is the truth from the very heart of business. Thank you so much for taking the time to write that review, Rachel. It's an amazing one and each one means so much. So if you'd like a shout out on next week's episode, you know what to do. So let's get back to the interview. Okay, Sean, welcome to The Truth About Business. And thank you for taking some time out of your, uh, I know you have a very busy travel schedule to share some business truths. So really looking forward to this one. So if you could teach us one thing that you think is going to help us enhance in business, what would it be? Care about the people above everything else in the business. Profit will come, revenue will come, and people are going to come and go. 
But ultimately, if you do not take care of the human element of the organization, you do not have a business going forward. What are some of the most effective ways that you found of looking after your people? Because we've had these conversations before with guests on the show, and you can go to some of these modern Googleized offices that have got the space hoppers, the breakaway rooms, the sleeping pods. Is that the stuff that works, or have you found it, it's something else? That's nice. Don't get me wrong. That is absolutely wonderful to be able to have in an organization. If, like many companies, you're a startup and uh, capital is limited, you're not going to be able to do those things. Uh, what I always say is you've got to be able to care at scale, whether it's one employee, 10 or 100. At some way, somehow, you can connect on an individual level with every one of those people. And knowing the name of Susan's dog and knowing that James likes a bit of Kanye West and Jay-Z in the afternoon, that's the kind of thing that will give you that connection to that person. I think where a lot of business owners and CEOs and entrepreneurs struggle with that is that they perhaps understand the concept that your people are your most important asset. But it's one of those activities that you can't mark a tangible result in a spreadsheet. And so it often gets pushed to the back of the priority file when you've got, you know, computer crisis or you've got to recruit somebody or there's emergencies all over the place. The last people that get or the last activity that gets looked after is going out there on the front line and speaking to the team. So in your role at, at Velas, how do you make sure that you have the time to do that? So as we've talked about, I travel a lot. I think last year was approximately 40 flights this year. I mean, we've just done uh, five or six flights this year already, I think. Uh, are you going back and forth to the same location or are you going all over the world? All over the world. So just this week, I've just done nine flights in nine days in the US. So the other flights I mentioned are outside of that trip. But being able to pick up the phone, because look, at the end of the day, we have 4G everywhere now. We've got Wi-Fi everywhere for certain. If you cannot find the time to send a one-line email to somebody on your team, your priorities are screwed up. Wow. And those trips that you're making, is that is that sales meetings? Is it seeing the team? Is it what what's where are you going on these flights? So our offices are geographically located in two different regions right now. We've got a UK office and then we've got an office over in Europe. So I am flying over to Europe every single month for a week. I have an apartment right next door to my office out there, so I'm spending a lot of time with the people there, which is really, really powerful. For them to see that you are not just a figurehead on a Skype call for you to actually be able to be present. The other meetings uh, and the other flights are sales meetings or meeting with other executives. And a lot of the time, including this trip to the US, that's nine days in nine different steak restaurants with nine different bottles of wine and having really in-depth, powerful conversations with people who you are either working with today or you hope to work with in the future, um, but also people you can learn a lot from. Yeah, so you obviously put a lot of, of resources, time and effort into get out there and meeting the team. And I can see, yeah, it's building a great engaged team. They see the leader in front of them. They see that you care for the business. So it must be a brilliant atmosphere to be a part of the team of. But do you see that coming out at the at the back end with the results that the business is producing as well? 1,000%. Uh, we just onboarded seven new people about three weeks ago. And one of the things that I did while sat in an airport, funnily enough, was I sent an email out to those seven new starters. Hey, guys, hope you're settling in well. I hope everyone's treating you well. Uh, if there's anything at all that I can do, bear in mind they have line managers, there's a HR manager involved, anything that I can do, let me know personally. And the responses were just incredible. The team's been incredible. The people have helped us. People have gone above and beyond. You know, there was nothing more you could have possibly done to have made this onboarding experience the first two weeks wonderful. And part of that two week, by the way, we took a whole bunch of them out to the mountains for uh, an overnight stay in the mountains, a barbecue and, you know, a bit of a get to know each other with the team. So, yeah, putting that value in, you see it. it. It really does show itself in the work, right? People feel valued. They want to feel like they're respected and they are valued in the company. It shows itself in the work every single time. So the, even from day one, they're seeing the CEO right in front of them, showing that you care, and that sets the agenda nicely for the rest of the time within the business. It does. Um, you know, and depending on how you look at things, obviously we've got people in different countries around the world as well, but I, I tend to think of the back office as the core team. And you know, if they see you not only on a, on a day-to-day call, I have a, I have a set call with specific members of staff every day of the week, and they know my schedule, they know that I book my flights well in advance, they know exactly when I'm out there, but also other members of senior management here in the UK also fly out there every two weeks, every three weeks. So we're, as, as uh, 
conscious as we are about the environment, unfortunately, in order to run a global business with multiple offices, you need to be in front of your team. You came to that answer very quickly when I asked what was your one thing that you could share about building a great business. So it's obviously been very important on your own journey. So for anybody out there that's listening right now, if you could just pick one thing that they could take away from to help them build a more engaged team and be a better leader to the rest of the business, what would that one activity be? The one activity is spend as much time on training your team, helping them learn and develop their own selves uh, as you do on looking at your P&L or looking at your sales forecast, right? And I think one of the big, big objectives there, and I heard it from somebody recently who put it in much better words than I could have ever done it before, which is look after your people personally, professionally, and financially. Help them achieve those three goals. And that mindset of looking after your people, is that something that you've been taught on a course or had a coach, or is that something that you've developed yourself after seeing the results in the different businesses that you've been in over your career? I made an enormous mistake with my first business, and it was an enormous mistake, and it's not having the ability, especially at a young age when I started my first company at 18. You know, We ran that very successfully for 10 years, but my mistake at that point was not having a thick enough skin and not being resilient enough to take some of the blows that are going to come your way. And I'll always remember having uh, fired a non-performer and went through their email to make sure that we weren't missing any files that we might have needed for a project and seeing some of the private conversations they'd had with other members of staff about me. Wow. And as good as I thought I was being to those people, sometimes, you know, things happen, right? You've got other priorities in your life. You might have a screaming child at home, for example, and if you take that into the workplace as a leader, everybody sees it. So I do share a lot of my personal life with my team. I'm also very conscious and very cautious that not everybody wants to know that I had a screaming baby at home. But you've got to have the empathy with your team, and they've got to be able to have that with you. And so now I put more emphasis on the team than I put on the PL. When did you make that realization that that's where you'd been going wrong? Obviously, you built your first business very early on. Mm. You said that that's where you went wrong. Was that sort of an early, early realization or is that now as you look back after your additional years of experience? I think it hit me quite hard at the time, if I'm honest. We did a lot of the Google-esque things, right? We bought a lot of the fun stuff. We had a six-foot helicopter flying around the office just oh, because that- it was fun, right? Because you put emphasis on that. But then you're missing some of the crucial details. You're you're not taking care of Jimmy when Jimmy's having a bad day and you need to actually pull him in and have a conversation because you just think he's having a bad day or get over it. And so it was doing things like that and having that realization going through those cycles. And also for myself, who's someone that has nowadays openly shared a lifelong struggle with mental health and depression, it's seeing that actually as much as you might shield that from your employees – some of those people are going through the exact same problems and they're trying to shield it from you. So sometimes it really does pay to sit down and have a conversation. And do you think that by you as the leader of the business showing a vulnerability and talking about these things to your team also helps them to open up and talk to you about those things as well, which is at least a step in the right direction? I mean, it really should, right? It's been a topic that has been put to one side, hidden or almost demonized for a long time. And now it's finally coming to the forefront. We're seeing a lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, if you want to go that route, a lot of entrepreneurs suffering with depression and mental health, some of them taking their own lives. I'm actively involved right now in a mental health group uh, in the the local region where there's a lot of people from different walks of life, whether they're on minimum wage or whether they're on a very nice package. This affects a lot of people. Yeah, and it's a topic that we've not really discussed on the podcast yet, but it is definitely gaining a lot of momentum now. When I looked in through my my LinkedIn feed, there's a lot of people talking about mental health and how it's affected them and some really inspirational stories as well. And now, do you think, particularly with your own suffering with with the mental health and, and the depression, was that a result of being an entrepreneur? Or do you think if you were on the other side of things, you'd you'd have still in, gone through that or not? It's often said that they're intrinsically linked. Obviously, you can do one without the other, of course. Uh, I grew up with a lot of pressure from my father, who ran a very successful business for many, many years and was ultimately groomed and and driven down a path of you must become a business owner. And in my eyes, a business owner and entrepreneur are two different things. But, you know, we can expand on that later. 
but I was. It was, you will be a business owner, you'll be successful, you'll do this and you do the other. And I think giving that to a young child is quite stressful. However, that said, I have always said if I had my time again, I'd still allow the same process to take place. And you learn to deal with it, whether it takes a little bit of time, whether it takes a lot of time. And I've spoken to people all over the world around this topic. Yeah, and, and I, we, we're, we're going to get into it a little, a little bit later as well because we're obviously going to talk about your journey. And I know that's, that's played an important part in it from the, the small conversations that we've had before we've started today. But how has that affected you? Because obviously I think it's something that people that haven't experienced mental health issues or depression can't really truly understand unless they've been through it themselves. So for me, you've come in today, you know, you're a massively positive guy. You, you're very knowledgeable, successful about what you do. And I think sometimes people can think, well, how can somebody in that position possibly be suffering from mental health issues and, and depression when everything seems to be going so right? So what's the story from your side on, on that side of things? Uh, it's really interesting because... I live in a nice place, I drive flash cars, I do this, do the other, and I'd regularly get the comment of, well, why are you sad? Why are you down? Well, it's not sad, it's not down, it's not the same thing, right? For me, it really did affect it because I found my... The only way I could distract myself from depression was working hard. But then working hard caused more depression, in my opinion, because I isolated myself from everyone. Ten years of running that company brought a lot of money it brought a lot of popularity and unpopularity at the same time I would force myself although I'm a massive introvert I would force myself to be in the newspaper as often as I could on the radio uh, on tv whatever it took and ultimately that plays a large part in further damaging that side of your mental I think and when did you have or have you had the realization that this was a problem that you needed to do something about and have you actively took steps to address it yeah, sure. And that's why, I, that's why I'm actively promoting it, especially for people who are in uh, leadership positions who believe it's a weakness to show that side of you, right? I've gone through one-to-one -one and group counseling for many, many years in, in different areas, right? That does not determine or detract from who you are as a business leader, who you are as an employee, or who you are as a person. How, how did it affect you? I struggled to accept that anyone or anything was right other than what was in my own head. And for me, it meant I worked 100 hours a week, every week, for 10 years. It meant that I collapsed in the office a couple of times because I refused to let go of my obsession. And my obsession was keeping away from the demons in my head. And that, to me, meant work. So I worked to keep it away. And that became a catch-22 because that also added to the problem as well. Correct. And the counselling and the one-to-ones? The -one oh, that, it helps that, massively. Yeah. Of course it helps. But it's like understanding, and a lot of people struggle with this, I suppose, understanding that a mental health issue is not somebody who's feeling sad or down. It is something that can be there forever or can be there for a short space of time or a long space of time. For me, I certainly look at it as it's probably something that's always going to be there. But my life has gotten significantly better. I started taking part in triathlons and got addicted to triathlons, which helped and thanks to Dino from Hoob for that because he got me hooked on that and was responsible for me spending a lot of money on equipment but that to me helped and they always say exercise helps right yeah. but I did 18 events the other year in triathlon and running that's a lot but that mental health issue is still always going to be there but so, it doesn't stop so for anybody else that is in a leadership position or is an entrepreneur or a business owner or anybody that might be listening to the podcast that feels they have mental health issues or depression and they haven't had the they haven't felt like they can tell anybody yet what would you suggest is the first step that they take the first step is probably not to tell somebody in your own organization just yet it, particularly if you're at a leader position go and seek professional help and whether that's an hour or two sat with somebody or whether it's a weekly occurrence that you need to do but believe me you will become a better leader a better business owner, a better entrepreneur, a better person by helping clear some of that out of your head. It's a little bit when you're looking at a sales forecast and you need to know what's going to land, what's going to get across, and what of this stuff is just garbage. It's a little bit like that. Clear these things out of your head, move those things to the side, sort it out, fix that, forget about that bit, or work on that, and you'll see yourself going a lot farther a lot quicker. Wow. Well, that's amazing. And thank you for being so honest, because it takes some courage to 
talk about it never mind on a podcast that's going to be listened to by thousands of thousands of people millions <laughs> so but yeah so thank you so for anybody out there that uh, feels like they're going through it at the moment then like sean says get some professional help because uh, it can make a big difference or just drop me a message okay and all the contact details and any links we talk about they'll be included in the show notes over at benjaminbrain.co.uk forward slash sean dash price so if you would like to get in touch with sean and that's a very kind offer thank you sean then that'll be there for you so your own journey, Sean. We've 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 mentioned tidbits of it already, but I'd like to to get into how you started because just looking through your LinkedIn profile, there's definitely some interesting parts of the story so far, and I know we're going to get deeper into that. So could you start off with your first job? How did you get it? Yeah, growing up, as I mentioned, my father had a, an IT business that was very successful uh, in the nineties, and I was always groomed as I mentioned to to be something I suppose in life particularly in the business arena so as a youngster whenever I wanted a part-time job whenever I wanted a summer job go to live in newspapers any any of this sort of stuff I was never allowed because it would always detract from what I'm gonna do eventually is what he used to tell me the first experience with entrepreneurialism I suppose is I opened a tuck shop in my school when I was a kid and I got permission and they thought it was cute you know go ahead Sean and in your first week when you're out selling the school's own tuck shop and they shut you down, Ooh. yeah, that was hard. That was hard. But when you're eight years old and you've just pocketed 50, 60 quid, At eight I mean, years old. I mean you, you're <laughs> laughing. So that was my first sort of taste, if you will, of that bug. And I, and I went on to do a couple of things over the next few years. But as my, as my father's business was very successful, we ended up moving out to um, Spain, which is where I lived for uh, almost 10 years. So I went straight into a Spanish-speaking school not speaking a word of Spanish, mind you. Um, I knew maybe one to three and yes and no, and that was about my limit. And quickly got thrown at the deep end, and it was, there you go, learn. I was a straight-A student up until the age of 12, when I, oh, 11 when I moved there. And going from straight-A to straight-Fs, because you don't understand the language, that was really tough. And for me, I had to figure a way of distracting myself. Now... Because my father's business was in IT, I had my first computer when I was probably age four, I imagine. And I'd very early on learned to program because that's how my brain works, right? I, I'm a problem solver. And what ended up happening was you learned to program. Well, now you learn to hack into things and break things. And So when you talk about programming, a lot of people talk about programming, but people that are not from that sort of world, can you give us like a brief summary of what programming is actually about? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't drag dropping making html websites it wasn't that it was more a case of writing programs that would do at that time malicious things so i would write a program that would shut down the computer lab at my school <laughs> you know i was i was writing programs that would format the hard drive and wipe all the files off of my teacher's computer that sort of thing okay did they know you were that dangerous at the time they eventually did yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so that to me was interesting because i could put my creative thought into something and see an outcome, I suppose. By the time I was sort of 16, 17, I was, I was hacking into machines and networks that I probably shouldn't have been doing. Thankfully, for the most part, most of it got away with it scot-free, which is great. But when I turned 18... Well, until now, that is. <laughs> well, statute of limitations passed, I'm sure I'm fine. Oh, okay. um, but by the time I was 18, I figured I need to get out of Spain because... The Spanish economy and the Spanish education system isn't up to par with the UK. Can't expect it to be. So I moved back to the UK when I was 18 years old. Now, in Spain, they don't do GCSEs. They don't do A-levels. So I have none of those. I have no GCSE, no A-levels. And at the time, I was pushed down the path by uh, my father to do university. And so I got a degree in computer science. That was tough to do because they didn't want me in the university because I had no GCSEs and A-levels. You cannot possibly do it because you're not smart enough if you don't have those. And as much as I admire some of the universities you know, around the country, and I think they're fantastic, I will say you do not need to be an A-star student in your A-levels to succeed in life. It's just not true. Uh, and I've always been a big proponent of the apprenticeship scheme. Done well is absolutely fantastic. So at 18, I've moved back. I've forced my way onto a degree course in computer science. And... I was missing half the classes because what I was actually doing was I'd started my first company, which was, in my mind, a computer security consultancy. Because if I'm hacking and breaking stuff, I can charge somebody to fix it. Turns out in those days, nobody cared about security. 
today they still largely don't, to be honest. Uh, it's still a very difficult industry. And after a short period of time, we pivoted that into um, a software development house, if you will. So I was making other programs for other people. At the time, it was a lot of e-commerce driven activity and CRM systems, so databases for people to hold information. And with my background in security, it made that inherently secure. So it was a good sell. Roll on to the final project of university. My thesis and my final project was a secure CRM system for um, educational institutes. And when they said, Sean, you need to hand over the source code and all the information, all the background scripts, if you will, for the program in order to pass, I said, well, I can't do that because I've just sold it to somebody. So actually, I don't own it anymore. <laughs> wow. uh, at which point, my lecturer said, well, we're going to give you the bare minimum, and I pass with a 2-2. I'm a pretty smart guy. I could have got a first, but I was more interested in building up my business. And again, I go back to what I've just said earlier. University is great, especially for some of the people you can meet, no doubt. But I do not and have never in previous companies that I've owned, companies I've invested in, or even this company today, we do not put a massive emphasis on what your grades were or which university you went to. So over a period of 10 years, I went from back bedroom to a very nice, profitable business uh, that I ran for 10 years, had some absolutely fantastic clients, some incredible staff that taught me a lot, you know, really taught me a lot. In the end, we, we transitioned that business off to, to other ownership. And at 28, I was what I referred to as semi-retired, which was an interesting position to be in, namely because three months after that transition, my, uh, my son was born. And going back to when you first moved over to Spain and you were chucked into the deep end in the school, was that part of your father training you to be a good entrepreneur or was that just a, a result of the circumstances that were in at the time? Do you, was that done purposeful to say, Sean, here's a big problem you've got to figure out, make it happen? Or was that just it had to happen because of the way things were going with the business? No, I mean, we lived in a very, very nice area, uh, the, the gated community kind of area, right? You don't move into that area unless you've got money sort of situation. And my dad was always one to challenge me. Now, there was a very nice private English school 15 minutes down the road. But his opinion was, I went to a normal school, you'll go to a normal school and you'll figure it out. So I did. And there's a very interesting conversation I had when my son was... Christ, uh, a few weeks old, I think, and I was in a bar here in Derby having a conversation with Kevin Madiri from Nelson's, and he said to me a really interesting comment. He said, you and I are entrepreneurs, Sean. We figure stuff out. So it doesn't matter that we went to a bad school. He says, but unless you know whether your child is going to be entrepreneurial or not, the best thing you can do is put them into a private school because it gives them a little bit of advantage just in case they're not going to be entrepreneurs. And that really, really resonated with me. Why did that resonate with you? Because life's difficult enough as it is. Finding a good job is difficult for most people. Holding a good job is difficult. It's, it's hard to find good companies to work for. It's hard to build a good company to have people work for. And when he mentioned that and he gave that comment, I thought, you know what, actually you're right. Because going back to what I mentioned about universities, it was all about the people that you met. I can hand on my heart say I didn't learn a single thing in three years at university. Namely because it was in a, a topic I really liked computing. I'd learned probably all of that at, at a very, very young age. So to be there 18 to 21, th there was nothing there new that I personally learned. But some of the people, even today, I am either in touch with, I am doing something on a business level with, or in case of one of them, we're about to start a new company together as a, as a side thing that I'm helping out with. So it's the people. Again. Yeah, and the connections that you'll make. So so given that opportunity there, so again, going back to this, going to, to school in Spain, do you think that had contributed towards your skills as an entrepreneur? Or was it just, did you already have the skills and it, it was just you putting them to use? Uh, when you look at setting up a shop and there was a period of time where I'd set up a school magazine and, and things like that, right? The entrepreneurial bug was always there. Yeah, It was just how it's nurtured. And I think for me, being dumped in a school at a young age in a very hot country and being confronted with people I could not communicate with, literally could not communicate with, that really sets you on a path of, well, how do I figure this out? Thankfully, nowadays, I'm very good at languages, which is great. Uh, I am fluent Spanish. 
And for me, it was it was piecing that puzzle together. How do I get across what I'm trying to do to this person? And I kind of relate that today to what we're doing in sales, right? Or even marketing to a large extent. It's you've got something to offer, whether it's I want fish and chips for dinner or whether it's I've got this great product. And you've got to get that across to somebody who may not know anything about fish and chips, may not know anything about your product, or may not know anything about you or your company. So it's a complete, complete sales process in a way. How old is your son now? He's three and a half. And so have you... Are you going to encourage him to be an entrepreneur himself or are you going to let him find his own way based on your own experience with your own father? Yeah, that's a that's a very, very interesting topic that happens between his mother and I. It's so tricky, isn't it? It's such a balance because I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and I'm there's just an, an always conflict of let them find their own way or you know, you can nudge them down a certain route or push them down a certain route. Very, very fortunate that when my son was born, I was in a very good place financially, which was wonderful to be in uh, wasn't the case when I was born and, and I think that's given him an unfair advantage and an unfair disadvantage as well because as much as he's been able to have and enjoy a lot of things that you know most people can't or don't it's also given him a very soft side mm. and I kind of look at that and I go mm, I may have screwed up a little bit here yeah and I, I can't remember who said it but there was I think it might have been one of the um the American sharks from Shark Tank, and they said, you know, your best asset is that you were, and it's it's easy for somebody to say that who wasn't born into poverty, but it is to be born into poverty because then you have the drive to get out of it, whereas people that are born into a more comfortable and luxurious lifestyle, you're comfortable. There's no need for you to expand beyond that. And that's what happened to me, uh, in a sense, at, at sort of 28, right? We, we transitioned that business off, and, and I'd been making good money for a number of years and made good money as a result of the company. And you'd really, really do get a little bit complacent. So if, if you moved over to Spain with the business that you're with now, and you you had the choice to put your son into the Spanish talking school or the private school 15 minutes down he, the road, which one would it be? He'd suffer. He'd go, <laughs> he'd go into that Spanish speaking school. He would? Without a question of a doubt. Okay, um, interesting. He's, he's bilingual as it is. His mother's German, so that really helps. Right? So I think he'd pick that up quite quickly. And I almost look at that and go, we learn two languages now. You're learning to speak with two sides of the family. That's going to give you some pretty good problem solving skills in the future, I hope. Definitely. You'd like to think so, most definitely. Okay, so you've, you're 28. You're no longer involved with the business. Your son's born three months later. We know that's not where the story ends. What happens next? Yeah, we transitioned that business off and I took a year and a half out. What did you do? <laughs> I was bored, mostly. No, I mean, it was great because, again, having the financial resources to do a lot of things, especially with a newborn, I was the only father at all the baby groups the baby yoga, the baby baby dance, the baby singing, all that stuff. And that was wonderful. I was also having probably two coffee meetings a day at Pride Parks, what was Starbucks, because I had to keep my finger on the pulse. I had to know what was going on. I had to be, you know, what's your business doing? Oh, how's things going? This and the other. I'd invested in a couple of smaller businesses. I was mentoring a couple of uh, youngsters as well in terms of what they were doing. Because at, at the time of running the business, I was also running Derby's Code Club, which was every Saturday for three years, I spent two or three hours down at Derby Central Library teaching nine to 11-year-olds how to program on computers. Like I was obsessed with filling my time and I was obsessed with teaching youngsters as well. So coming out of all of that, you know, I just needed to find something to fill my time almost. Um, I hired a PGA pro to teach me to play golf on the recommendation of a friend who said, you look bored, you need to figure something out. Well, that's the done thing, isn't it? When you retire young as, a, as an entrepreneur, it's getting into the golf. Yeah, and, and I hated every minute of it. <laughs> and I think I think I prepaid something like 20 hours and I took four hours lessons I never went back <laughs> uh, over at Morley Hayes, which is a fantastic place to go. But yeah, it wasn't for me at all. And then I, eventually I got an IT firm here in Derby who had approached me and said, hey, look, you know, we'd love to get you on board and, and you know, get in a part of what we're doing. And I spent a year and a half with uh, with that firm and really got to understand how the IT network and an IT support side of the world worked because for 10 years I was in software, right? Those networking and hardware guys, I mean, they were shifting boxes of equipment and tin and I had no interest in that. That's not scalable. Software scalable. Um, but when I got to see how that business model worked, I kind of got a little bit hooked on that. Uh, after spending a year and a half there, I took a little bit of time out to take care of some family health issues. 
My son's mother got pretty ill for for a while, and I had to take care of that. And as she got better, she said, uh, "You need to go back to work because you're crawling the walls and you're driving me mad as well." <laughs> okay. So I then got involved in a larger IT firm on Pride Park, and one of the best things that they did. I mean, at the time they were doing what appeared to be tremendously well. Uh, one of the best things they did was they sent me out to Las Vegas to a conference, which was the Service Industry Association Conference in, in the US, which is a, a network of companies, if you will, that are doing a large-scale IT logistics, effectively. And I attended the conference, and I networked the hell out of it. Being an introvert, I know that if I'm in a new place, I need to go all out. I can go back to my room and rock backwards and forwards later, but I need to do the, the, the thing, right? How do you force yourself to get out there and do that? No, it's the only choice. Nobody's going to buy from you if they don't know you. And nobody's going to trust you if they don't know you. And so it's one thing to send an email, and like they're doing now, send a lot of text messages to customers and clients. It's not the same thing, right? You've got to meet someone face-to-face. Hence, I do all the travel that I do now. And case in point with a lot of salespeople now, you go, well, where are you with the client? Oh, I've emailed him. I'll give him a call. I'll email him again. Pick up the phone and call the guy or go and visit him. So for me, it's that's your only choice to get anywhere. But no, I went to this conference in Las Vegas, got to understand the industry, met some very, very important people in the business. And I saw it and I thought, ah, oh, this is a business I could really sink my teeth into. And there was talks of, you know, some ownership structures and everything else with the company that I was with. And Ultimately, I uncovered a few things that made me very uncomfortable with the business, and I left. And what I ended up doing was pulling out two of their very senior members of staff from that company. One had been there for 20-plus years, and another one had been there for about six years. And I said, look, what's it going to take to uh, get you guys out of this company? Because I think we're going to do something really special. They told me. I almost passed out. (laughs) And I said, well, look, you know, in the words of Branson, screw it, let's do it, right? And so we set up... Velez, we ended up pulling a number of staff out of different companies in the UK and Europe. And it was, well, I know how to run a business and how to grow in a business. And I know the pitfalls that I'd had in previous companies. So let's not make any of those mistakes. Let's learn from the mistakes that these IT companies that we were part of had been making. And let's grow and let's do something really, really terrific. And how were you able to attract good people who were involved in businesses that were long established and already had a client base and were successful to a a new venture that had no track record. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I focused quite a lot on, on profile and making sure that I was seen and known. And as much as there are hundreds of people who dislike me, there are hundreds of people that also trust me as well. Do you think that's the natural part of being a successful entrepreneur? You are going to polarize people. You're going to have people that like you, but you're also going to have people that aren't so fond of you. You bring it on yourself sometimes. Certainly. There's certainly things that I've done in the past where I've really poked the bear and tried to get under somebody's skin. You know, and they try and do the same back and it's fine. I understand that. But I think that the biggest thing is that if people see that you're doing well, they can't figure out why they're not doing the same. And it really, really agitates people. Case in point, there was a previous competitor that I had in the old business who I think back then, 2015, 2016, was probably, I don't know, 10 employees. Um, I looked at their company today online. I think there's still 10 employees, right? And that was five years ago, right? But then you look at what we've done and we've been able to demonstrate that through industry knowledge, through good employees and good hiring and good practices, we've done what one of our competitors, actually in this region, one of our competitors, we've been able to do what they've done in three years, we've been able to do in less than one in terms of growth, revenue, service delivery, etc. So if people believe, they'll follow. But you've got to demonstrate that what you say is not bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So you sell in the dream, but with integrity. You have to because, you know, the business we're in, uh, you know, we deliver large-scale IT projects across the world. Um, If you let somebody down in this business, you've probably cost someone hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. If you let someone down because you've released a website a week late, uh, chances are, 
chances are it's not that damaging, right? If we slip up on something, it costs money. So where did the name Velez come from? Uh, so Velez is a small town, village, if you will, in southern Spain. It's a place we used to visit quite a lot. Uh, it's a place that we um, uh, had looked at buying a house once upon a time. And beautiful, beautiful place. It's Velez Malaga is the, is the full name of the place. And one of the things that I was looking at, and, and I'd done this in previous companies, was always have a name that was unique. Nobody could copy or rip you off or hurt you on search engine optimization online, right? And I think one of the key areas of that was I wanted something that wasn't um, this, this IT or tech this, tech that. Because really, you're not differentiating yourself from anybody. And nobody remembers you, right? Nobody remembers you. I go to conferences and we travel around the world. It's like, you, you guys are from Velez. Yeah. Rather than you guys are from tech something, something. Differentiate yourself in branding. Yeah, and one thing that I'd also say as well is before we started connecting with regards to arranging the podcast, I, I had no idea who Velez were. I, no. I didn't know you. And it's got quite an international ring to it. Mm. Like I, I saw you comment on one of my LinkedIn posts and I thought, oh, wow, this international guy's coming. And then I saw he's based in Derby. It is, and that must help, especially for international clients as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, our, our main centre of operation is down in London. It's where we get a lot of stuff done. Up here, we've got a small satellite office because I can't stand working from home, so I need a desk somewhere, and there's a few of us in the office here. But it is an international company. We've got, as I mentioned, we've got uh, multiple physical, physical officers, not, not virtual, physical officers, which is a big differentiator in our industry because... Uh, you look at some of our competitors and they'll list they've got 25 officers around the world while well, they're all PO boxes and a, and a forwarding telephone number, right? Um, so it's, you have to have integrity in what you say and what you do. And I think with regards to how we position ourselves, yes, we have this office in Derby. Yes, I live uh, 30 minutes outside of Derby City, but we're not a Derby company. And I think that's an interesting place to position yourself in. I'm seeing a lot of firms of our type who, there are some in Derby and there are some in the Derbyshire area, if you will. They're reverting back to doing local IT. They're reverting back to doing smaller size projects because it's easier and more manageable. Whereas I'm going, we're going bigger. And that's that's my big focus, right, is that we don't want to be restricted. And that's, that is how I feel about Derby. It is a very restrictive place to do business because it is so small and intimate that we've got enormous growth potential internationally. So we have recently joined the, mem- um, the Chamber of Trade and Commerce here, the East Midlands Chamber, and I think that's great because they, they offer some fantastic services. But today I think we've fielded six phone calls from the marketing company that does the marketing for those guys, and it's like, I'm not really interested in placing a, an advert in your magazine because it doesn't drive any business for me. Now, there are companies in the... Um, the Derbyshire region that we have worked with, and you look at some of the big players in, in automotive and rail and that sort of situation, fantastic. But for us, it is, it's a hub, it's a base, and it's a place that's got nice cafes and bars. <laughs> Most definitely. So when you first came up with the concept of Velez, how did you know, given that I would imagine like most industries, it's a fairly competitive industry to be a part of, mm. how did you know that Velez was going to be a success? And what are some of the things that you've consciously done? You've talked about differentiating yourself already. Are there some specific ways that you can differentiate your comp- yourself from the competition? Or is it down to the usual price and location? In our market, price is very, very competitive. Uh, no two ways about it. And I think that is down to the pure nature of international, right? A lot of IT companies, including some of the guys in, in this very city, they outsource their back office to India because, hey, it's cheap. It works. The problem there is that it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to to grasp what they are saying with different accents. And, and that's different accents on both sides of the phone call, by the way. right? The Derbyshire accent isn't the best in the world. But also, not only do they do that, it's the time zone difference, right? So we've got, our, we've got a big office out in Europe, which is GMT plus one. We're one hour ahead of the UK. Most of my team are educated in either American or UK institutes, even though they're overseas. So you call our office, it sounds like you're talking to an American or a Brit. It works well. So for us, it's understanding the pain points that all of our customers and all the customers of other firms similar to us have experienced. It's time zones. It's getting stuff done. It's reliability. So we pride ourselves on service delivery. 
In fact, we've got two mottos in the company. One is whatever it takes, and you'll often see that branded on a lot of the stuff that we do. And that is whatever it takes, assuming it's legal, right? We won't cross that line. (laughs) But the other one is, and it's in our email signature as well, it's doing right by the customer first time, every time. Because if the customer's not happy, the team's probably not going to be happy, I'm not going to be happy, and we ain't going to have the business. So just being in the US, uh, came back two days ago, sat down with a company who had been using another firm in the UK and said, we call these guys, they don't pick up the phone. We email them, maybe take six hours to get a reply. I said, right, call our line right now. Just call it. Three rings, bang, answer. And now I'm emailing someone going, why did it take three rings? So service delivery is key. And as I mentioned, our head of service delivery across the globe is a a chap called Trevor Hempel. And after 20 plus years, we pulled him out of this other organization here in the city. And when you've got customers calling you up and saying, this is really good, like you've done what you've said you're going to do, you haven't let us down. And even when there's been a hiccup, right, and we've had to uh, recently spend 400 euros on an Uber to send an engineer back to site because I think rail was down. And we pocketed that 400 euros. We'll pay for that. Don't worry about it. Don't even include it in the invoice. We do whatever it takes to make it work. And that's the real key differentiator is actually doing what you say. And is that part of, of you as an entrepreneur as well? Would you say that's contributed towards your success as a, as a business owner? That attitude of I'm going to do whatever it takes, whether it's in a Spanish school or building a business? Yeah, I hate letting people down. And don't get me wrong, I've let people down over the years. And to me, I, I really detest that I have done that, but I'm only human after all. So at scale... And you, I can tell you really wince when you say that. So you yeah. say that with you know gen, genuine authenticity as well. A hundred percent. And I think at scale with a company, with employees, with different departments now, with uh, line managers and team leaders, you've got the headcount, you've got the capacity to do the right thing. There should be no excuses. And everybody takes that very seriously in what we do. And I think that if you can be as serious in your day job as you are at home in terms of how much pride you take in your work then you've got an absolutely winning team and for us one of the greatest achievements we've had so far already which was fantastic is there's a research analyst company called Gartner multi-billion dollar company and they do analysis on the IT sector amongst other things they release an annual report of the top companies in our sector around the world And we were featured in the 2019 report, which was an enormous, enormous boost to credibility for us, right, for such a short time in the industry. And that's a big endorsement for anybody out there that's looking for your type of services. Huge. And, you know, there's two ways to get featured in that report. One is you do incredible work and you have clients and suppliers recommend you. And that's a big ask because to get someone to write something up and submit it without you asking them is a big ask. And the other way to get on there is to not pay to play, but to be a a member of Gartner's research uh, allows them to know more about you. So by them knowing you intimately, obviously they can rank you in that report. We don't pay. For us, we found out that we had two clients and a supplier, all individually submitters and and write, and that's an enormous credibility boost. So I say in the office that, you know, if we do something bad, that's on me. But if we do something good, that's all on you guys. And that was a huge, huge moment for us. What a great mindset, though, as well, especially for the leader of the business. If you could rank yourself on a scale of 0 to 10, before you'd launch, Velez, of your certainty that this was going to be a success, what would you have said? Um, I've got enormously thick skin now, more so than I ever had, and I was pretty thick skinned before. And I'm ready to take as many hits as it needs. And I was probably a 9 out of 10 certain that this was going to work. The only doubt I ever had was were people going to take a new company in this sector as seriously as they would with one that's got 10, 15, 20 years experience? How did you deal with that? Prove them wrong. Uh, and that's that's all you can do. And explain the differences. How did you find your first client then as Velas? Uh, we landed our first client super, super early on. And it was literally, we decided to start the company the next week. Out of my own pocket, I flew out to the U.S., And I just knocked on doors, effectively, of some of the big organizations. For me, LinkedIn is a power tool. It's an absolute power tool. And I tell this to my sales guys as well, right? You could email me, and it might take a week to get a reply, because I get so many emails. 
You send me a LinkedIn message. Right? I'm on that thing all day long. That's, that jumps ahead of my email queue. And that's what happened was I'd LinkedIn message, not in mail, don't have to spend the money. I had a LinkedIn message a couple of VPs and C-level folk uh, in certain organizations that I wanted to get in touch with. And I said, hey, I'm in the US next week. I'm in your state, insert state here. And uh, I'd love to just catch up, have a chat, have a conversation. I hadn't booked any flights. I hadn't booked any trips at all. I just told them I was going. And uh, as soon as I got one bite, I booked my flight. And I ended up seeing, uh, I think it was nine or ten companies in the space of a week in nine or ten different states. And by the time I was on the flight home, we'd landed our first gig. And it was a significant amount of money. And that just allowed us to just go. Why start in the US? The US is more entrepreneurial. The UK is far more reserved. And I think the smaller the, the city, the more reserved, right? And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is that Derby is, is a micro city, in, in my honest opinion. Take out the Bombardiers and the Rolls Royces, etc. There are not many entrepreneurial companies in this city. And I might get some flack for that, but that's the truth of the matter. And London you know, it's hard to break into. But you also know that London is predominantly financial. The US is a very big place to be. And there's a lot of business to be had. And most people get it wrong by either basing themselves there or putting all their eggs in one basket with one particular client. And we've seen a number of UK and European companies go bust very, very quickly because they work with one client and one project and that's it. And they hope for the best. And they have to take loans out to keep themselves going, etc. But it's a big place. You know, 400 million people, is it? I think somewhere there, thereabouts, there's going to be a lot of potential. And knowing who your target customer is, and by the way, I'm in B2B, not B2C. So with B2B, I literally know the name of who my customer is. I can go on LinkedIn, this size company, this sector, this job title. I know that it's, you know, Jack Jones. The the business books will always tell you to create a customer avatar, you know, give them a name, give them some interest and then target that one person. But for a lot of businesses, it's hard to start off. It's like people always ask me with the podcast, who is your target market? And it's, well, it's anybody that's interested in business. But mm. yeah, if you really want to grow it, then you need, but I can't define it because, you know, I have, I have business owners listen to it. I have people that are in a job that listen to it. I have younger people listen to it that aspire to be. So I don't want to target for the sake of alienating other people but and you, you you've can, had that that laser focus on that sort of customer avatar from day one so was that a conscious effort and it's obviously helped you to grow phenomenally over the first sort of 18 months in practice yeah it has and i think you can niche yourself out of business right you really really can and again going back to the reservedness there's so many companies so many companies in it and in other areas in this city and greater and beyond who cap themselves out at about that 2 million revenue. Well, that's because they pretty much targeted everyone that they'd had in that niche little focus. Above and beyond that, how do you target anyone else? How do you find anyone else, right? So we'd got a great idea of who our business preferences were, were who our clients were going to be. And we didn't have it down to a T in terms of it has to be this specific uh, avatar, if you will, but it was this profile of person, this, this sector but also this job title helped a lot. And again, you don't need to spend enormous amounts of money on advertising because that tool LinkedIn is a great little tool and that's been responsible for ungodly sums of money. Wow. Amazing what the social media platforms have, have enabled people to do. You know? It is, and you don't need to go to you know great lengths to train on how to use it. If you can open the website or open the app and type in a search box as you would Google, that's kind of all the training you need. Yeah, but then it's just having the actual courage 100%. And, and the conviction to your course to go out there and actually contact people who have never heard of you before. 100%. So I've got a couple of questions for you. I usually ask what's the one biggest challenge, but I want to tackle two different aspects here, and it might be the same answer for both. So what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you since launching Veles? The biggest challenge is accepting that you are ultimately a remote CEO, whether it's three officers, whether it's the fourth one we're in the process of um, doing at the moment, or whether it's 400, being a CEO that's not in the office every single day, or not in each office every single day. And I took some great advice from a, a CEO in the US 
who has approximately 50 officers for their company. I said, how? Yeah. How could you possibly be present to those people? And ultimately, his answer was not too far removed from what I said earlier, and it's care, right? So for me, the biggest obstacle is I'm not in this office for four days. Okay, I've got a manager there. I've got everything else, but I've not been in that office for four days. What's happened? Or, you know, what don't I know? And then you're in that office. Well, what's happening in the other office whilst I'm not there? Having great people, great line managers, and coming from a software background, having great software and processes and procedures in place helps enormously. But that is by far the most difficult thing I've had to deal with personally as the leader of the company. Okay, which I imagine is going to be a very similar answer to this question, which is what's the biggest challenge or what are some of the challenges of being an international business? Because you're definitely the first international business that I've had on the podcast so far. Time zones. Time zones are an absolute killer. As I say, having just come back from 10 days in the US, I landed in New York. So I'm on New York time zone. That's great. By the time I've landed, uh, and we are a 24-7 organization, so we have people working at every hour around the clock. But landing there, being on the wrong time zone, getting the data on your phone or the Wi-Fi, picking up all those emails and starting to hammer those out while you're waiting in customs and security to get through. And then the next day, I flew to the other side of the US. I flew over to the West Coast. All right, you're on another time zone now. And every day for nine days, I flew to a different state. And in that time period, I changed time zones four times. Keeping up on top of what you're doing. I've got to fly out to Dubai soon. I've got to fly out to China. I've got to, well, when it's safe. All these things on different time zones and appreciating that your urgency might not be the same urgency as somebody else who, when it's three o'clock in the morning for them. But also there's, there's the workload aspect to that. But also how do you maintain your energy and your positivity and your enthusiasm? Because I presume in each of those time zones you meet in a potential new client and the last thing anybody wants to do as soon as they step off a plane, especially if they've been in three different time zones over the last nine days, is to go and present and pitch to somebody. Super hard. If you ask my team in the offices, they'll tell you it's probably Red Bull, but uh, <laughs> I don't drink coffee. Um, no, look, get in sleep. You've got to be able to get enough sleep. And again, one of the things I learned after exiting the previous business was I needed to take care of my mental health, which included fitness. So I run, I do triathlons, I cycle, I have an indoor turbo cyclist so I can get miles done in the house. And then I meditate most days, which is something not a lot of people know. That's uh, a secret weapon. Interesting. That is something I have tried to get into for so long, but so just hard. always find the time to do something else. And there was somebody that said to me, if you don't have the time to meditate, that's when you know you need to meditate. So... How did you get into making that a staple part of your routine? And what are some of the benefits that you felt as a result? I'm a huge, huge podcast listener. And you bombard me with enough advertisements about a particular app, I'm going to install it. <laughs> and I kept hearing uh, Headspace yeah. over and over and over again. And I installed it and I thought, do you know what? I'm committing. I'm buying a year's membership up front. Whatever it was, £100, I can't remember. And, and I liked it. I really, really got on with it until eventually... And I lived in the Southwest for some time. Eventually, the Bristolian accent wasn't quite calming enough for me because the guy that runs it is a Bristolian chap. Um, and I thought, I, I need something else because if I'm not able to focus like I once was, because they're, they're very samey, they're very samey, the guided meditations on Headspace. Uh, I found out about Calm, which is the bigger, more powerful and more venture-backed it, brother. Is that C-A-L-M, just spelt normally? Calm.com. Yeah. Com. Okay. Headspace is like $100 million dollar. Calm's like $500 million apps, wow. so big difference. And there was male and female voices. There was different voices, there was different stories, there was different avenues, different topics. And that's the one that I've been hooked on for the last couple of years, especially. And whether it's 10-minute reboot, like literally just find 10 minutes, and yeah, if you can't find 10 minutes, you really need to reevaluate your schedule. Um, that for me is a huge win, just in terms of decreasing anxiety, getting focus back, and clearing through some of those decisions and thoughts that you need to make, right? I, I get a lot of good thinking done when I'm running, but I also get a lot of good thinking done, controversially, when I'm meditating. I come out of it and I go, ah, that's what I need to do. Do you have a set time of day that you try to get your meditations in, or is it just whenever you get that spare 10 minutes? Considering that depending on where I am, 6 a.m. is very difficult sometimes if I'm on a completely different time zone. Uh, I try and stick to first thing in the morning, 6 a.m., if I can help it, because I get up pretty early usually. But the more I travel, the more it tends to happen sort of afternoon into the evening. And it depends if there's a client dinner involved. If there is, then it's definitely got to happen early in the morning. Otherwise, 
after a steak and a couple of glasses of wine, it ain't happening. And no, it turns into a falling into sleep. Never Correct. mind meditation. Correct. I, I gather from talking to you and having looked at your experience, you are obviously very knowledgeable in the in the service that you provide in the IT world, but you also strike me as a very capable leader of the business as well. And I think that's quite a rare combination in any industry to have somebody who's very knowledgeable and, and super skilled at what they do, but is also a good leader. So there are obviously aspects of the job that I get from talking to you here that you really mm. enjoy. Which parts of the business don't you enjoy? What wouldn't you do if you had the choice? So in previous companies, I made a couple of mistakes early on, and a lot of that was around not delegating enough, right? Not letting go, because I'm a control freak. As most entrepreneurs tend to be, I like to know every little detail of what's going on. So when we started Villette's, literally two of the super, super early hires was a HR manager. And I'm a HR-driven CEO, right? Like, I care about everyone. But that needs to scale, and I need somebody to take care of that side of it. So a HR manager was one of the first employees, and a finance manager, like, as an entrepreneur, as a, particularly as a sales and, and operation-led entrepreneur, I am all about chasing those big wins, but then remembering to get paid afterwards? It's, it's not in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I think as, as daft as it sounds, it's something that happens to a lot of us. You're so focused on chasing that next sale that the actual income that the business is generating becomes a, a thought at the back of your mind. And I, I get daily updates from, from finance and HR on what's going on in the business because I need, I need to know, right? I'm obsessed with knowing what those details are. I'm just not obsessed with chasing them necessarily. So those were probably the two of the biggest ones, and they've been working out fantastically. Case in point, had a conversation recently with our finance manager. They'd uncovered a lot of money. we just not gone around to billing. We didn't even know it existed. And for someone to just go, you've missed this. And then, you know, that's at scale with processors. It's invaluable, and it's just not something I could have got my head into. What would you say is the biggest mistake that you've made in your entrepreneurial career so far that you that you feel comfortable talking about on record? <laughs> oh, on record, that's probably very different. Letting work get in the way. And I can't go into too much detail, but letting work get in the way of friendships and relationships when you probably should have put those first, Sean. And I think for me, because I was obsessed, and that's what it was, it was it was a genuine obsession for 10 years, everything else kind of fell to the wayside. And I felt the aftermath of that after the fact. You learn from your mistakes. But given, particularly with that first business, given what you took out of that mm. and what it's led to moving forwards throughout your life, would you have changed the way you did anything knowing what you knew then? Yeah. I mean, if I could rewind and go back to 21-year-old me, 25-year-old, 28-year-old me even, and there's possible still ways of salvaging certain things, I'd have told myself to care more about what's going on outside of the office than what's going inside the office. But I also know, knowing myself, that I'd have turned around to myself and said, go away. <laughs> <laughs> in a very polite way obviously but very well put okay okay interesting and what would you say again throughout your whole entrepreneurial career doesn't necessarily have to be with Velez but if you could pick one moment so far that you're proudest of or your biggest success what would you choose I was in um, a Virgin Atlantic aircraft sat on the runway at Heathrow Airport if I remember rightly ready to take off it was quite late at night and I was flying to New York for the first time I was going there on my honeymoon, and I sat there, and I thought, you know, I've just got to check my emails one more time before we take off, because God forbid I don't have Wi-Fi for eight hours. And I remember checking my emails and seeing an email on Christmas Eve, this was, from a prospect I'd been chasing probably for three or four months, and had not got a single bite off this guy. And I opened that email, and he goes, yeah, we'll do the deal. And it was a great amount of money and it was a huge, huge win for me because it was something that I'd chased for months and almost just let it go. Which business was that with? This was with iVox back in the day. This, okay. was, a, this was a tremendous deal and uh, yeah, it, it changed the course of what we were doing. So that was, that was absolutely magnificent. But on the flip side of that, there's probably one memory that I have of one of my clients who gave me a fantastic piece of advice and that's always stuck with me as a proud moment. I had one particular client who was an entrepreneur that had sold a couple of businesses. And at the time, I was 21, I think. And he didn't want to know me because I'm a nobody, right? I'm a 21-year-old guy in a suit that's telling him I can do these things. 
And eventually we got to know each other, we got to work together. And he turned around and said to me, he says, you know what, you're one of the few people I've ever met, regardless of age, that talks the talk and then walks the walk and actually gets it done. And he says, I'll give you one piece of advice and it's where you're failing pretty badly right now. He says, you've got a fantastic network, you know a lot of people, but you need to connect the dots. Connect people to other people. And I sat back at 21, 22, whatever it was, and I'm like, what the hell are you on about? But it's true. You know, your network defines your net worth, right? There's so many people that it's the reason I put my mobile phone number on a forum the other day and I just said, go at it. I've got six hours to kill. Text me, email me, whatever. You never know who you're going to be connected to, who you need to connect to, and what value you might have towards someone, even if they have no value towards you in a professional setting. So what's next for Velis? We've got a very, very exciting future. And I'm more excited about what we're doing with Velas than I've ever been about anything I've ever done before, professionally, obviously. We're in the midst of opening up an interesting office somewhere. We're in the midst of hiring rather aggressively. An interesting office somewhere, is that top secret? Yeah, I'm not going to say the location because it will probably show some of what we're up to, I suppose. Okay. But we're hiring aggressively. You know, I I stood at our Christmas uh, party in December and... I said to the team, I said, this is where we're going to be next December. And they said, well, really? Like that many? I said, well, look, we're hiring a little bit ahead of what we need, but ultimately we're hiring safe. We are very rigorous in our hiring process. And what we're trying to do is build a very large, sustainable business. I want to approach the 200 employee mark over the next two to three years. Wow. And I think... Given what we're doing today, given what's coming up, given some of the learnings that I've got from fellow CEOs in, in, in our industry as well, seeing what they've been able to achieve, I think that's achievable. How do you see your role changing as you grow to a business of that size? Or do you see it changing? <sighs> yeah, it's got to change, right? It absolutely has to change. And I like to think I'm changing day by day towards that. A lot of what we do today, both hiring, both process-driven, everything, we are designing today to be there already. So you're speculating to accumulate. 100%. Yeah. 100%. You know, we're profitable, which is great. Uh, We are doing all the right things process-wise. But one of the things that I saw as a mistake through other businesses in this sector was throwing people at a problem rather than trying to solve the problem itself first. And so... We have invested heavily in technology, very, very heavily in technology, to avoid certain problems we saw in other organizations. There are companies in our industry that have pools of administrative um, employees working on little problems day by day. And my opinion was, why have 10 or 12 people doing this one little job when it can largely be automated and have two people manage it? And those other people give them much better, fantastic jobs. And the truth of the matter is, if you've been around for 30 years, you're probably struggling with the same old software and infrastructure that you've always had. And ultimately, you know, we've not had to go through that. We've get to start from scratch and get to build that up. So if we were, you know, if we were, if we were struggling with the same sort of architecture these companies were, we'd have to have a lot more people purely to manage the stress. So, yeah, we've got a very interesting year ahead. So so you've invested in the infrastructure, not just the, the fact that you're bringing more people on board to deal with the extra business, but the actual way that this, the business is set up to deal with the, the problems and the processes that you're going to have to be handling at 200 people. Yeah. So that, that's a more expensive way of, of doing things. It's not when you get there, but it is to begin with. So you have to have total confidence that, yeah, I'm going to spend more now, but now I've got to make sure that we grow to that size to make it a worthwhile investment. I mean, you look at sales, marketing, service delivery, all the things that matter to us, right? I can tell you of businesses at 2, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20 million that are either not using a CRM at all or using a free CRM or they're using free email tools or they're using Outlook to manage 10,000 tickets that come via email. We invested really heavily on salesforce.com from the very get-go, and salesforce.com is one of the most expensive pieces of software out there you can get. It costs us thousands, but it does the job for us. It does so much of the handling and the heavy lifting um, from managing, you know, 400-plus opportunities that are in the system today to 
uh, handling thousands of tickets a month. You'd need a lot more people to handle that and a lot more brain power. And I tell you what, you'd have your team hitting burnout a lot quicker if they were not leveraging technology like we do. We know about your speciality. We know about your journey. Now I'd like to dig into a bit more about Sean, the businessman, and your views on what it takes to be successful. So you've obviously had experience of growing multiple businesses yep. now. You work with very successful business owners all around the world. If you could pick maybe two or three attributes that you've identified, be it within yourself or within these people that you've met, what would you say are the sort of key attributes that people really, that are successful, exude? Kill the ego. That's such a such a big one, right? And I think, I was speaking to someone recently about this, when you're in your 20s and you're out earning everyone you know, you have a lot nicer things and life seems really, really good, it's easy to miss out on the important things. Kill the ego because it's going to end up killing you, physically or in a business capacity. Nice, I like for how sure. you put that. And then I think the other one is almost interlinked to that, and it is you need to have incredibly thick skin and be massively resilient because you're going to take hits financially, personally. Um, the number of personal attacks I've had over the years has been astonishing. Some deserved, I'm sure, not all of them. But have thick skin because, you know, I remember the very, very early days of iBox, we had a customer who agreed they were going to double the value of their contract. And I thought, this is absolutely brilliant. I was over the moon. I was I was the most happy person on the planet. The day before signing, they pulled the contract all together. The whole contract? The whole contract. They went bust. So I went from being smug. Cloud nine. Absolutely. To being, that was my biggest source of revenue. And just being in an immense panic. So you've got to have the resiliency to be punched in the face 135 times a day. And just about managed to get back up to do it again tomorrow. And that is the God's honest truth. Do you think that's a, that's an attribute that people are born with or can it be developed through going through those experiences? You know, that's the whole, is an entrepreneur born or made, right? What, um, do you, what do you think? What would be your answer to that? I genuinely think they can be made. I really, really do. That said, it is not, and this is what probably grinds my gears the most, it is not a case of you set up a Shopify website or you set up an Instagram account. And or a podcast. In, you know, or a podcast. <laughs> and in six months' time, you're wearing... A nice fancy watch like you've got, or driving a nice flash car, it does not happen that way. You know, there isn't this whole passive income, I make millions while sitting on the beach. It just doesn't work. You have to put the time and the effort in. And so, yeah, an entrepreneur could be made, but you know, it's probably going to take more than three years. It might take more than five. Yeah. You've got to be in it for the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've got to have a lot of personal attributes about yourself, you know, and just understand that it ain't going to come easy it's not you don't put entrepreneur in your bio on linkedin or twitter or instagram you don't put ceo on a business card and just be one person working from the bedroom it doesn't work that way because people see through it they genuinely do and a lot of the time it will actually prevent you from getting business i sat down with a, a young lad and is that is that that's linked back to when you said kill the ego? Is that 100%. what you think it's down to? Is yeah, it is. It is. I see that guy on Instagram with a Rolex, a Ferrari, and some nice company. I can do that. It, no, no, because that's an enormous disrespect to those people that have spent ten, twenty, thirty years building a business. And you know, I don't categorize people as having lifestyle business. I think that's unfair. Because not everybody has the same ambition. Or version of success. Yeah, yeah, everyone's version of success is different. You might be happy on 25 grand a year and there's nothing wrong with that. But you might also want to take 25 grand a month and there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it's spent appropriately, of course. So I think those people that have got the ego that say, I can do that in a year, are just massively out of depth. Don't disrespect those that have taken their time to get there. And don't be surprised when the downs come because they do speaking to somebody recently and they left a company not so long ago because the owner took such pride in what he thought he was building and had such a large ego that the company was covering all of his personal expenses it was paying for his mortgage he was just bleeding the company dry and you go 
well, how do the other people in your company feel about that? You know, when they see those things happening, because it's transparent, right? It's transparent enough. You know, don't be that guy that acts the millionaire but spends every penny in the coffers. That's the truth. And you've already mentioned meditation with mm. regards to being a staple part of your routine. Do you have any other sort of daily routines or habits that you fear have contributed towards your success? Yeah, I'm an avid reader and I'm a huge audible audiobook listener, but there's also nothing better than an actual book. So whenever I travel, I don't have it with me today actually, but whenever I travel, I carry my Kindle with me. And I'm a big Apple fanboy. I've got an iPad Pro and I've got Mac, whatever. Kindle. You cannot get distracted from reading because it's all you can do on a Kindle is read. So whenever I'm traveling, whether I'm in a car or an Uber or whatever it is, I'll pull that thing out and I'll get 10, 15, 20 minutes worth of reading done. And, you know, there's lots of books out there that will tell you how to run a business or what to do. There's a lot of books out there that will tell you the nasty stuff as well about business. And that's kind of what I prefer. Mm. I kind of want to know what's going to hit me and what's possible and, and the nightmare scenarios. So meditate, read, do some exercise. Whether it's, you know, I, I like to run most days if I can. Uh, it's difficult when you travel, but I try to most days. But get fit in your mind, get fit in your body, and the financial fitness will follow. Nice. And if you could recommend one business book for any aspiring business owners out there, slash entrepreneurs, people who aspire to be a leader one day, what well, would I've you not, pick? Yeah, I've not yet finished re writing my book, but... Um, ah, well, that's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> There's two books I'd probably recommend as, as go-tos. One is um, Andy Grove's Only the Paranoid Survive. Okay, I've not so, heard of that one. The guy that basically founded Intel Computers. Right, okay. Um, that's a fantastic read. Um, really sets you up in the right mindset for dealing with some of the, the demons that come down the path. Okay. And then um, a book called Reboot by a chap called Jerry Colonna. So do you remember GeoCities back in the day? Uh, the name rings yeah, a bell, but I can't was, remember what it was. It Something was to do with online. Yeah, it was one of the old... Um, Build it yourself website kind of setups back in like the, a Wix like, yeah, or a yeah. super super early on in the in the web era, and um, so Jerry Colonna was uh, effectively a venture capitalist, and that was one of the companies he ended up buying, and it was one of the big exits, and you know the guy the guy made a metric ton of money, and he was considered himself to be you know one of the best out there, and he would travel from New York to LA in the same day and back again because hey he's rich he could do that. And now, after going into a deep depression himself and you know almost committing suicide and all these things, he became a CEO coach in the US. Uh, he had a famous blog called The Monster in Your Head, and he studied Buddhism and all these things. And Reboot is a, a podcast and a um, CEO group that he's led in the US for quite some time. And he's now just released this book only three or four months ago, I think it was. And I've read this book twice now. And at the end of every chapter, there's probably 10 questions that it asks you to write down. You know, and straight away, put the book down and write straight away. And I cried more than once reading that book because it asks you some deep, dark stuff about yourself. It's a business book and it's a life book. Wow. Um, so what, what's, the, what's the toughest question then in the book? You don't have to give us what your answer was, <laughs> but what was the question? I've got all the notes on my phone, actually. Um, it's getting to the underlying reasons of why. Just just why everything. Why do you act like this as a leader? Why did you do that in the workplace? Why are you like this with family? What do you think those who work for you think of you? They're scary questions to think about. It is, especially if you don't take the time to think. You just put it down and you write straight away. You know, Then it's it's stream of consciousness coming out. He's known as the CEO whisperer. I've heard of him. Yeah, yeah I've definitely you, heard you, that you will phrase. Have, you will have seen probably some of his videos online. And as he likes to say in his in his talks, um, his superpower is making CEOs cry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy to see why. You know, When you get that German, you get to the bottom and the root of somebody as a leader, you quickly understand why someone runs the business they run, why they run the type of business, and how they run it is so often rooted in childhood trauma. Oh, yeah, that's, I mean, when I did the session with Estelle Reed, it's just crazy to think that those early years have such an impact on who we are for the rest of our lives. It's 
it's crazy. But oh, yeah. there's also things you can do about it as 100%. well, which is the good thing. Yeah. So it's all very well getting to those root causes, but what was the what was the main takeaway that you took from that? Has that led you to doing anything different the way you you lead the business and you are as a person? I think it's simply enhanced some of those earlier learnings that I'd had from from the previous companies. I remember many, many years ago, we got broken into and had iMacs and MacBooks stolen from the office, you know, tens of thousands of pounds worth of equipment. And I remember getting the phone call going, hey, we've been broken into. And I went down to the office and I saw, and I saw the window had been broken and all the equipment taken. And I was cool, calm, and collected. I walked out of the office, round the corner of the building, and I punched that brick wall because I was furious. But I couldn't let people in the office see that. And what I've taken away from this book is largely those learnings that I've taken of being able to be mindful of what's going on, to not let anger rule what you're doing in the workplace. Because it is so easy to make rash decisions based on micro pieces of information. And a micro piece of information to you is different to how it will be to somebody else. And a comment passed by somebody can mean something immensely different to somebody else. And especially in our organization where we've got multiple languages, multiple uh, ethnicities and races in our company, what is said by one person means something completely different when translated and accepted by somebody else. And I learned that growing up in Spain when I made some incredible, incredible mistakes with the Spanish language. I thought I was saying one thing in Spanish and it meant a completely different other thing. Yeah, but I mean, even just emailing somebody in the own business. Context. Exactly. So to add, a, like you say, a different cultural and language aspect to that, I don't even want to think about that. So, wow. But yeah, some very interesting lessons to learn. So thank you for that. Now, you mentioned your own book. Is that something that you're actually doing at the moment? Have you started to write your own book? No, I haven't. And um, I'm, I'm not sure it would get much uh, much attention, to be honest. No, I it's not me, right? Like uh, the genuine, authentic me, as I mentioned, I'm a massive introvert. I could write a book, but I, I don't think I've got a story to tell just yet. There's still plenty of story no, to go by the sounds plenty of it to as go well. By, yeah. so, but if you were to, what would you call it so far? If you were to write a business book based on your own journey so far, what would you call it? Uh, probably what I call my blog, which is uh, Entrepreneur in Recovery. And the important thing about that is it's not drug or alcohol recovery, nothing like that at all. It's recovery from being an entrepreneur. Right, okay. Because, as I mentioned, I was obsessed. I was driven. It, it put me in hospital multiple times. So the way I look at things now is I don't do 100 hours a week anymore. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. So for the, for the last five years, I've consider, or the last three years rather, sorry, I've considered myself an entrepreneur in recovery. Yeah. Learning to recover from that addiction. See, this is interesting because I, I I did a post recently on LinkedIn and I called it the the business rites of passage mm. with regards to you are in a seemingly, from what we've talked about today, great position now. Sure. You work far less hours. You have a much healthier balance of life. You enjoy what you're doing. Do you feel it was necessary to go through those 100 hours of work, those hospital visits, visits to get to where you are now? I still say yes. And that sounds terrible. It really does. And I still think it was necessary for me, not necessary for everyone. And certainly the worst thing in the world you can do is follow someone else's blueprint like for like, right? Mine is definitely not a blueprint to follow, but it served me very well. Okay, interesting. Interesting answer. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being so honest with the answers as well. You've already mentioned that you were a mentor to some young entrepreneurs um, and you were doing the IT club. Mm -hmm. If you could pass on some expectations of what it's going to be like as an entrepreneur to somebody who's not experienced it. For example, what do you think people have as misconceptions about being a business owner? What do you tend to find, particularly with the younger generation, they don't realize they're going to have to deal with as a business owner or even the older generation that yeah. still has aspirations of starting their own business? I think the biggest misconception is that the business owner makes the most money. The business owner has the best life. The business owner gets paid more than anyone else every month. What's the truth to that? <laughs> That's not the truth at all. It's nowhere near the truth, especially in the first few years. But then, hey, a recession comes around and the business owner is the one that gets paid last because every single employee has to get paid. I make probably a lot less than most of the guys that work for me because it's more important that they get paid. It's more important that we grow. So the misconception is that the business owner's got a nice five series BMW. God, 
he must be he must have a good life, right? Well, no, actually, the company pays for that because it's a requirement in order to get from A to B to C, etc., and do and do business. Well, you know, you could have always had a cheaper car. Well, yeah, you can, but then there are certain tax advantages and so on and so forth. So, not looking at the superficial and not assuming that you're going to start a business and in twelve months' time you're going to have saved enough money to buy a house, you're going to have the, a nice car, and you'll have upgraded from little to shopping at Waitrose. It just doesn't come easy, right? It takes time, and a lot of people give up before they get there. And then realizing that, you know, it's 2020 now, uh, we're due another recession right about now, and that's going to kill off a lot of businesses, it's going to hurt a lot of people. So once again, those business owners will suffer. Now, if you've got some money in the bank right now as a business, and you're hoarding cash, you'll probably get through this recession quite nicely. But it's still going to be painful. And assuming you are a recession-proof business is not true either, because realistically no business is recession-proof. So that's some of the things that I've just spoken to recently about people who wanted to start up in business and go, well, my business won't get affected by a recession. Yeah, it will, because everyone's pocket tightens Mm. no matter what. What are some of the benefits? What do you enjoy about being a business owner? Well, the default answer by everybody that seems to get asked that question is usually freedom, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's freedom. Fine. To me, it's always been about being in control of where I'm going and what I'm doing. So your destiny is up to you and nobody else? A hundred percent. And I think for me, the benefits of entrepreneurship and the benefit of of being a a business owner, if you will, is that if it goes bad, I've done something wrong. If it goes well, we collectively have done something great. And that will shape what things look like. And I've had good times and I've had bad times, and I much prefer having good times. So I know what work is required. I know that even though I don't do 100 hours a week anymore, I know where those important hours are spent. And I also know that no matter what, some things are out of your control. But I also know that, do you know what? It's 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon. i got to go pick my son up from nursery. Priority number one. Easy as that. Okay. Well, I've just got a couple more questions for you, Sean, before we wrap up for the interview today. The first one being, if you could summarize all the lessons that you've learned along your entrepreneurial career, the challenges that you face, the people that you've met, and we were sat in front of somebody here that was about to start a business, and you could give them three pieces of advice that would prepare them for success in the best way, what would they be? First piece of advice is quite simply, go sit in a room on your own, no social media, no outside influence, sit down and write down on a piece of paper what it is your business does. Why is it better or why is it at least competitive with those out there? Right? It doesn't have to be unique. You know, Facebook was copied from something else, right? Sit down, get that down on paper and then stare at that and decide, is this what I want to do for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years? Because you may never retire rich off a business. It may just provide you enough income to get by and that'll scare a lot of people away from doing it but if you love what if you love it and it's you truly passionate about it that's going to be less of an issue the 50 years time working in the business uh, we, we might be getting off track a little bit but i actually have an issue with that whole folly passion thing okay i think that's fake for for a lot of people i think it's fake i think it's a misconception and a piece of advice that People that have done well already yeah. will give you that because it's easier than what I just said in step one, which is figure out if this is really what you're willing to dedicate all this time and effort for because everybody has a business ultimately to make money. Yeah. Now, whether it's enough money to pay your rent or whether it's enough money to go to the Maldives, it's about money. And so follow your passion is, in my opinion, something that people that have already done okay or done well use almost as an excuse. Well, I would rephrase that because for some people, they're passionate about sitting on the beach drinking pina coladas and you're not going to make any money from doing that as a business. But would you say that you have to be passionate about what you do? No. I say you don't have to be romantic about how you make your money whatsoever. And that was a lesson my dad taught me. You know, my dad had been a a jockey. You know, I'm very tall, so that's my mother's side. But my dad was a jockey. Then he was a truck driver. Then he cleaned toilets and and all sorts. And he, he told me. You do whatever it takes. And that's kind of where our motto came from, right? Whatever it takes. I can figure out a way, sat with somebody, how they can build a business doing something that is enjoyable, 
but it doesn't have to be your passion. You know, your passion might be sat playing Xbox. And yeah, granted, there are people making money doing that. Very few, though. Very, 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 very few. few. Yeah. But you know what? Slog away for 20, 30 years, building a business that is, you enjoy the people. Maybe you enjoy the people more than the business activity. But it's a business at work. So that's more of the focus. I think the second piece of advice really is, um, you know, figure out not not what you're passionate about, but what your principles are. I travel all over the world. I'm a very patriotic person. So despite everything that's happening with the monarchy right now, I'm very, you know, very proud to be British and all these things. That can be seen as a negative to some people that can be seen as a positive to others. Stick to your principles, but be willing to accommodate interact and accommodate with other people yeah. right because not everything i think say and do is correct just as it isn't for somebody else so define what your principles are stick to those principles and be willing to be accommodating to other people around you yeah i okay. like it great piece of advice and then number three goes back to that great piece of advice and it's a it's a guy called andrew scott who uh, who gave me the advice of connecting the dots All right it's the aid old adage of your network defines your net worth connect the dots get people to work together and interact together you'd be amazed what happens there and you know to this day uh, although he was a client for for several years i still consider him to have been probably one of the most influential mentors i had connect the dots yeah so when so now that you or when you first started to understand that concept fully did your mindset change with regards to when you are making connections Instead of thinking, how can this person help me or how can I help that person? It's how can somebody else in my network contribute to this person and vice versa? Is that a mindset shift there? Then? Yeah, I think it's killing the ego goes back to that central theme, right? Not every handshake, not every drink, not every introduction um, has to matter to you personally, financially, especially. I don't go to networking events, really, because I find that they're not very beneficial for most businesses, they're not. It's usually just a, a beer and a catch-up for a lot of people. Um, there's no no real business happens at a lot of these network events anyway. But what I will do is if you ask, do I know somebody who does ABC, chances are somewhere in that 8,000-person phone book of mine, there probably is somebody. And I am always more than willing to make a connection, whether it repays me further down the line or not. And I'd like to hope somebody one day pays it forward and says, hey, I know this guy, Sean, he might be able to help you with your problem. It's as simple as that. Three great pieces of advice there. So thank you for sharing those. My last question for you. You're obviously somebody who's not afraid to get your contact details out oh, in the dear. open. <laughs> so if anybody out there does want to find out more about Veles or they want to talk to you maybe about some of the mental health issues that we've discussed, whereabouts can we find you? Easiest place to find me is just to go to LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash in slash Sean Price. You'll find me. As I say, it's a pretty quick and easy way to get hold of me as well, right? So Yeah, now your LinkedIn inbox is going to oh, be yeah. flooded. You're going to be going back to the emails. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, Sean, you've mentioned there your phone book of 8,000 contacts. <laughs> and you obviously know some very, um, very successful entrepreneurs. So I'd like to put the question to you. If you could pick one or two people out of that phone book that you think would make a great guest on the show that could share their truths and their experiences, who would it be? I'll tell you what, I'll give you, um, and hopefully you won't hate me for this, but Andrew Scott, who's the CEO of the Ascot Group, which is a, a group of companies in the Southwest, uh, this is the guy who gave me that really key advice about connecting the dots. Yeah. He'd be a terrific, terrific guest to get on. I mean, my schedule's tight, but this guy's uh, this guy's hard to get hold of. But hopefully, you'll make it happen. And then the second person, I mean, Andrew was very much uh, somebody I looked up to and uh, and still do. But he was a mentor many many years ago. The second person I'm going to give you is someone who I look up to today, I suppose, in many ways. And we're in the same industry, effectively we're competitors. But I really respect the guy, and I like what he's done with the organisation he's in and uh, the path they've taken. And it's a guy called Dwight Stryer, who is the COO of Service Express, which is a large company like ourselves in the IT logistics and IT maintenance space uh, over in the US. I was just in their offices last week, actually. Tremendous business, but super, super people focused as well. So they've grown immensely over the years. And I think a lot of that comes down to how Dwight runs that operationally and far more inspiring than I can ever be. 
Well, I don't know about that. It's definitely been an inspiring hour and a half plus so far. But Andrew and Dwight, I will be uh, I will be in your inbox soon. So watch out for that. And obviously, any help you can provide on that, Sean, is much appreciated. No worries. Okay, well, well, thank you for that, Sean. And like I say, all of the links and any resources that we've mentioned, they'll all be on there on the show notes at benjaminbrain.co.uk forward slash Sean dot price. So Sean, once again, thank you for your time. I know you have a massively hectic travel schedule, so really appreciate you taking some time out to share your uh, your business truths with us. Thank you very much. And uh, just want to wish you and the the team at Velez all the best for the future. It sounds like you're on an exciting journey, and I'm definitely going to keep a close eye on how things progress. So uh, thank you, and all the best for the future. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. And as always, thank you to the listeners. Thank you for your support. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode as much as I have, and I look forward to catching up with you on next week's episode of The Truth About Business. One final thing before you go, if you enjoyed this interview and want to make sure you don't miss out on the next episode with another real life business champion, make sure you subscribe via iTunes, Spotify, your favorite podcast app, or by visiting my blog at benjaminbrain.co.uk and hitting subscribe. At the blog, you'll also find the show notes to this episode, which includes all the relevant links to the website, social media channels, contact details, and anything else that was discussed in the episode. Just type in the name of the guest, and that will bring that right up for you. And finally, I'm always on the search for great business owners who would be happy to spare just a couple of hours of the time to share their business experience with our audience. So if you know of anyone that would make a great guest or you'd like to feature yourself, just let me know. Send an email to hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk and I'll reply personally as soon as possible. Also, if you've got any feedback, questions that you'd like me to ask our guests or any other suggestions, I am definitely all ears. That email address again is hello at benjaminbrain.co.uk. So that's it for this episode. I just want to thank you sincerely for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay hungry, stay fearless, get out there and make it happen.